If you are afraid of micromachining, in other words, using end mills smaller in diameter than one eighth of an inch or three millimeters, this episode is for you. Welcome to another episode. Most of my experience working with CNC machines is actually using end mills of one eighth of an inch or three millimeters roughly in diameter or smaller. This is a look inside my partially organized drawer. And the thing that you can see is that I have some 3 8 inch end mills, but fairly quickly they get smaller and smaller. So this row is already 1 8 of an inch diameter for the most part. And then we get to 1 16th, 1 32nd of an inch. And then we get down even smaller, like uh, 15 thousandths of an inch in diameter and 10 thousandths inch in diameter. All of these are end mills that uh, I used on my tag before I got my haws. And the point of uh, making that comment is to explain that, you know, something like a 10,000 uh, diameter end mill, this is a ball nose end mill, you can use on a machine that's not very rigid. You just have to be very conservative about your feeds and speeds and depth of cut and width of cut. Here's a look at uh, what I have loaded into my tool changer at the moment. Uh, these, these are uh, it's a 20 tool, tool tool changer, which is mostly full. There's one spot missing because I broke an end mill. But you'll notice that except for a few large cutters, the ones in the back are all micro machining or micro end mills. This one, for example, is my um, 132nd inch diameter super long reach end mill, which is 15 millimeters uh, length of reach. And uh, it's funny, I mentioned this before, that they mentioned the diameter in Imperial, but the reach is in metric. That's how they measure it though. I started with a Roland MDX 15 or 20, I don't rem remember which, which had a maximum shank size, I believe, of 1 8 of an inch. And then I moved up to a TAG desktop machine, but most of the work that I did was for injection molds for small detailed parts. And so I needed to use smaller end mills, which means I was uh, rarely using end mills larger than one eighth of an inch. In the early days, I did it by trial and error. And that meant that I broke a lot of end mills. So uh, eventually I kind of figured out, okay, here are some feeds and speeds that work for these different end mills, and I stuck with that. That's not how I do things anymore. And the difference between the way that I used to do it and the way that I do it now is that with my current approach, I can work with uh, standard reach end mills, which are uh, three times the diameter for the reach, all the way up to super long reach end mills, like uh, 1 32nd inch diameter with 15 millimeter stick out, which is over 10x. Um, what I'm going to do is show you the process that I use working with these end mills. And for the most part, I don't break end mills anymore, uh, even the really tiny ones. When I do break an end mill, it's because I have done something with the cam that causes the load on the end mill or the side force to be too high, such as I'm taking more of a depth of cut or more of a width of cut than I calculate the feeds and speeds for. So let's head to the computer and I'll, I'll show you how I calculate the feeds and speeds. I personally use GWizard for all of my feeds and speed calculations. Other applications like HSM Advisor, I don't have experience with those. So I'm going to focus on GWizard and show you how I use it. And I imagine most of these things will apply to other speeds and feeds calculators. So I'm going to first show you how to do this with a tool kind of the hard way, and then I'm going to show you the easier way to do it. So let's start out with a, for example, a 20 thousandths inch diameter end mill. And the thing that you'll notice is first it says you need 30,000 RPM. Now I mentioned that I used this successfully with my tag. I'm currently using it with the Haas the OM2 that has a 30,000 RPM spindle. But I'm going to show you the, the difference between them. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not sure why the surface feet per minute is so slow, um, but we'll come back to that. Oh, I see why. This is currently set to a drill. So what we want to do is switch to an end mill, and I'll do a normal end mill, and I'll just leave everything the way it is right now. 
And that's going to show you a few things. Uh, in particular, I have the stick out at one inch, which is awfully long for 20 thousandths diameter end mill. I'm going to keep the width of cut to be basically full slotting width, and I'm going to set the depth of cut to 10 thousandths. Or let me do less than that. Yes, which is 50% uh, of the diameter. There are a couple of things you're going to see right away. One is, as I mentioned, it maxes out the RPM. But the other thing, which is something really important, is the deflection. The deflection is the thing, in my experience, that tends to break the end mills. Now, another thing that's important is this aggressiveness scale. What I've discovered is that you know, the less rigid the machine, the farther to the left you want this. So for a tag, for example, that has a 10,000 RPM spindle, I might set it like this. Now, the stick out I mentioned is way too long. Let's set this so that it's a standard reach end mill, which means the reach would be three times the diameter. So in other words, 0 0.06. So if we change this to 0 0.06, you can see that it's okay with the RPM now. And the deflection is okay. So if we want to get the deflection down to give us a better safety margin, we might want to reduce the depth of cut to 5 thousandths of an inch. So this is uh, what I use to calculate the speeds and feeds. So this is telling me that I need to run at 10,000 RPM. It's suggesting I use conventional milling rather than climb milling. My guess is that's to reduce the deflection uh, even further, because with climb it could catch and try to pull it into the work and therefore snap the end mill. And then the, f the feed rate is pretty low. Switching this to 30,000 RPM, you know, watch what happens to the feed rate. You can see that it goes up quite a bit, which is what you would expect. Filling in this information and uh, setting everything up for each tool as I go through and do the cam is pretty painful. One of the things that's nice about G-Wizard is it has this tool crib. What I've done here is to create the different tools that I'm using fairly often. So you can see here's the 132nd inch super long reach end mill. And what that means if we go back to feeds and speeds, I can use the default crib and then I can set select that uh, super long reach end mill, which is right here. And now that's filled everything in. So I've got the stick out, I've got the, uh, the number of uh, flutes, the tool diameter, etc. And this is showing that I can use the 5,000 steps of cut with the 20,000 uh, width. If I do slotting, you can see the deflection becomes too high. So that means I need to do, reduce this even further. And, you know, I think using a depth of cut of, you know, either one or two thousandths of an inch is what I ended up doing. I think I used one thousandths of an inch for the depth of cut when I actually used this. So obviously you don't want to use these super long reach tools for everything. What you want to do is work your way down. Uh, let me actually bring up the case where I used this uh, tool and show you how I actually used it along with other tools. Here's one of the parts where I used the super long reach end mill, which is uh, this one right here. Oh, actually, that's a ball end mill. This one right here. So it's the super long reach, as you can see, flat end mill. And I used it down there. But of course, I needed to remove material from this area before I got there. So let's take a look at the, just briefly, the steps for getting there. So the first one is we're using a 3 16th inch flat end mill to get rid of a lot of the material. And then we're coming back with a 1 16th inch flat long reach end mill. And that's getting more of the area. If I were to redo the programming now, I would change how I did this. So don't take this approach as the important approach. But thing, the thing to notice is that it's removing more and more of the material there. If we look at this operation, you can see that it has a stock to leave of 10 thousandths roughly radial, but zero in the axle. So that means when we come down to, let me go down a little bit further. So when we come down to here, we're doing a scallop, uh, but it's not completely cleaning that up along the wall here. So this is where what I wanted to do is 
use this horizontally and you can see it cleans up that wall there. And so if we look at the, the scallop, you know, it has a ball end mill. So the ball means, and there's no stock to leave, the ball means that there is a little bit of material. And so that means that when we run the 132nd inch long reach end mill, we're not using too much material. Now if we take a look at the speeds and feeds, you'll notice that we're running at about uh, 10 inches per minute. And if we go back to uh, G-Wizard, we're using the same super long reach end mill, and this is pretty close to the 12 inches per minute. This is for slotting, whereas here I'm actually moving over by less than the full slot width, but I was being conservative. and. I did several different molds with the same end mill and did not break the end mill, so I know it works. Here's another element that definitely requires micro machining, which is the logo here, uh, the mod mount logo. And let's take a look at it. The first thing is, if we take a look at the depth here, you'll see that it's uh, 10 thousandths of an inch. Uh, in some cases, the depth was smaller. In some cases, for example, it was only a, a couple thousandths of an inch. But the more important thing is the width right here. You can see that it's just 21 thousandths of an inch. So that means in order to mill something even approximating the shape, I need to use an end mill that is no larger than 20 thousandths of an inch. What I'm actually using for an end mill is something which is, oops, wrong one, something which is pretty cool. I'll bring up that tool. And what I often do is I sort by diameter. So the first thing that comes up is the tool that I'm using. This is a 60 degree engraver. So you can see it has this shape here. And the very end of the tip is just five thousandths of an inch in diameter. If we simulate that, uh, this is going to take a little bit. So first I'll show you the toolpath before we simulate it. The toolpath is right here, which is a pocket toolpath. And you can see it's doing several depths of cut. And it's actually, because the tip is so fine, it's giving us the shape that looks uh, fairly close to what we want. I'm not doing a full simulation uh, because that takes a long time, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like. Here's that same part. This is actually one that uh, I made a mistake on and had to remill. But uh, you can see this is the logo. I can barely feel it. Um, I think we changed this one so that it was only a couple thousandths of an inch deep. Uh, but you can see the, the detail turned out really well. Here is also another piece, not the same one, uh, with the logo on it. And this time you can actually read it. Uh, and again, it's, it's uh, very, very shallow. You know, it, but it looks really, really good. And I was able to do that with that small 60 degree 5,000 diameter tip end mill. And I've used that 5,000 inch diameter um, engraving end mill quite a bit and have had no problems. Uh, in the previous video, you can see an example where I ended up accidentally milling something that wasn't supposed to be milled that way. So the uh, angled sides on here were milled by the sides of the engraver which was not the intent and ruined this part. Uh, but the tip is fine. It was not broken by that. That's one nice thing about using a 60 degree engraver, which is the tip is going to be a lot stronger than if you actually used a 5,000 diameter conventional, you know, standard reach end mill or even a stubby one. I also have a 3,000 uh, di inch diameter tip. Uh, that I haven't tried yet, but the 5,000 stamina tip has worked really, really well. That's a little bit of an introduction to micro machining. If you have questions that I haven't answered, uh, please comment below, and I'll see if I can answer them either in the comments or in a future video. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, comment below, and I'll see you next time.